Well, hello, Wyoming and guests. Uh, welcome to uh, the free Wyoming Culture Change Coalition uh, monthly webinar. We are in our third year of a three year grant, and you know, that's pretty exciting. And I just certainly hope and wish for Wyoming that we do a lot this year. We could use your help, anyone listening, um, to spread the news and uh, join us on our events. I'll, I'll tell you more at the end uh, with some dates, etc. And then uh, today we are looking at the artifacts of Culture Change 2.0 tool again. It's a lengthy tool uh, for good reason. It documents culture change practices. And forgive me, we're just going to zoom through two sections. And I'd love to hear from you if you think we should have done this different. Is it too much, too quick? <laughs> it's just hard to know. Um, plus, we wrote this grant uh, like three or four years ago. So uh, here we go. If you're not familiar with the Artifacts tool, um, it was designed and uh, actually funded by CMS in 2006. It came out of central office. I was very blessed to be a subcontractor for the original tool. And then we got an, another grant. CMS ended up paying for it again, <laughs> which is kind of funny, um, with a CMP grant actually out of the state of Maryland. And um, we, we did create a 2.0 version. And we do think it's even better. It, it wasn't bad. But now one thing better about it is that um, it's a simple tally. So if your community got serious about completing it, we do recommend it be done with a group, not just one person, because you want to verify that everyone agrees whether these practices are implemented or not. And then on that note, you would you you decide if it's fully implemented throughout the building, all residents, et cetera, like that, depending on what it is, or is it partially implemented or not implemented? And then uh, part of this project is homes like um, Star Valley's on the line and Life Care of Casper and others have been a part of this project. Another piece of this project is five homes per year uh, committed to using this tool and choosing at least three practices. Everyone did more than three. That's pretty common. And so whether you ever join a project or not, your home, your company could use this tool. We highly recommend it. Uh, whoever you are, if you just make copies, guess what? And give it to people. We call it an educational tool. They will learn culture change practices. We call it a, hopefully it's an inspirational tool because you go, yay, let's do that. And then it can be a benchmarking tool. We recommend doing it, completing it annually. And if, you, if you're serious about implementing practices, guess what? Your scores, your tallies will improve because you know, it's just kind of a neat design of data that you'll see improvement. So um, enough about that. There are five sections. Last time we did more on, the, on the, about the tool and then uh, we covered resident directed life. And today we're gonna cover these two sections being well known and home environment and accommodation of needs and preferences. So here we go. Being well known. How do you like that title? I love it. It's really a premise of the culture change movement to be well known. And I hate to say it, but sadly, in many of our, you know, historical, traditional, institutional nursing homes, I would challenge you to think about your process of getting to know people. And are you really getting to know the details of their lives? That really helps you when you know those details. Uh, sadly, typically, there's a lot more details we could be learning. And I've just seen it backwards, you know. Like, here's an interesting example. Someone keeps being found on the floor found on the floor, found on the floor. Turns out he wasn't falling. He was getting down there on purpose. Let's, let's say a person prayed on their knees, right? And so think of your systems. Do they help you to really know people that Hello? well before you- Hi, Tr Trace, I did not it? even see your text message. I was the hard the way. <laughs> oh, okay, here we go. All right, so moving into this section, uh, one of the practices is that you- purposely collect more information, we call it about a person's life story, as well as current interests and preferences. So there's one thing to be said about past interests, right? And are they current? They could be both. Um, and so when you see an asterisk, uh, it does refer to a guidance document uh, at the end of the artifacts tool. So a life story is meant to go beyond the typical traditional, again, social history, 
to get more detailed information showing what makes this person uh, unique as an individual. And it goes beyond a lot of the demographics. You know, I've done a lot of audits in my years and it really saddens me when, when all we ask is kind of the same questions. Where were you born? Where'd you go to school? Did you get married? How many kids? <laughs> Sometimes it's the end. So don't let that happen. Uh, by the way, we're really trying to move towards um, life stories instead of social histories. You could start just with calling it that, but better yet, you know, go after more information to truly make it a life story. Uh, then we have um, trying to understand expressions and preferences of those who can't tell us verbally, who can't communicate with words, and then getting that on the care plan. So I always use this as a fun example. If I had just spit out my green beans, what did I just tell you? Without words. <laughs> Those are nasty. I don't like them. <laughs> Yay, Brittany. Guess what? I was on the call yesterday, everybody, with Bighorn. Irina, one of your homes, just started the project. I said that example. And the new culinary chef in the kitchen, when I said the green bean thing, he goes, now, if you had some melted cheese on them, you probably wouldn't spit them out. <laughs> yes. Isn't that's, that great? That's too funny. Carmen. Isn't that great, Irina? Good for him. Um, <laughs> that's how a serious, you know, kind, loving culinary chef thinks, right? <laughs> that maybe we could have made them better. But the point is, we want to, we want to, we want to honor those of you that were close with people and you know that kind of stuff. We have to honor your observations of people. They tell us stuff all the time. It may not be with words. So that's actually a practice to really go after that seriously, to understand people, even when they can't talk to us, uh, communicate verbally. So the next one, each care plan is specific to the individual, yay, and it reflects that person's goals. How many of you are tired of making goals up for other people? Anybody? <laughs> Brittany, I wouldn't make up goals for you in, in our life right now. You wouldn't make them up for me. I just love reminding everyone it is not normal what we have done in the institution. And the CMS regs now reflect this. In the new set of regs, which came out in 16, um, they reference the residence goals at least 153 times. I haven't done a word count since the later iterations have come out, but it didn't used to be that way. So take advantage of that. Plus it's a culture change practice and you could choose it if you were using the tool that we're gonna go after what this person says is their goals, not the daughter's goals, not the doctor's goals. And again, even with dementia, I challenge you, I bet you could figure it out. You, um, again, you observe well, and you can ask people who know this person what their goals might've been or have been, or you think they would tell you are now, or even ask people with the dementia, you know? Um, it's so precious to me that a lot of times, even though people have dementia, they can answer your questions, right? So then we have the, uh, a beautiful process and, and practice of actually care planning the seven domains of well being. Now, these have been identified by the Eden Alternative. Uh, go to their website if you want to learn more. Um, they got a grant years ago, thought leaders in our movement uh, really uh, were so smart to help us look beyond care, that what really matters to people, you know, quality of life, well-being, and they call them the seven domains of well-being. And when the new regs came out in 2016, guess what? There they were. Um, in fact, I don't know if I have the reg next, nope, but we reference it on the artifacts tool. Um, notice it says as listed at CMS 679. Now that's the activities tag, believe it or not, under the intent it actually says that the nursing home is supposed to support Sorry, residents. Sorry, Judy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Only these now. Six, five, five, oh, seven. Oh, um, in in having these seven domains of well-being. So imagine you move into a nursing home. Any one of us could, I suppose. Sadly, um, you know, an accident, days in the hospital, and guess where we might end up, right? Uh, how would you feel if you were asked, now we want to know what brings you joy? <laughs> I just love that one. Let alone your identity, who you really are, 
how do you like to be connected to people? There's so much, this is a whole webinar by itself. Security, meaning, what brings you meaning? Autonomy, what's important to you to be able to choose growth? Did you know we're all supposed to be growing at all ages, even a hundred? <laughs> Nobody talks about that, but people in the culture change movement. So you could do that. Um, and it's actually in the reg, everyone. So then we move on to care plan includes uh, movement. And we're trying to get at the fact that it's smart to help people move. We're, notice we're not talking about therapy and restorative. Those are kind of given, but how can you still help people move individually? Uh, being stronger prevents falls and being stronger prevents injury even when people do fall. Um, also getting outdoors, this tends to be important to most of us, maybe not everyone, but trying to go after some things that aren't required but are important to people on the care plan. Similarly, music, I don't need to give all the benefits of music, but um, really getting after the type and how someone likes to listen to their music. Some of us like earbuds, some of us don't. Some of us want the radio, some of us want other ways, you know? So actually on each resident's care plan. Then we're still on care plan. Uh, also identifying what brings meaning and purpose to them. Uh, Life Care of Casper and Star Valley in working over the, the year that they were in the Culture Change Project, they both focused on this. And if you haven't watched their videos, um, you'll see residents doing a lot of volunteerism and it is precious. Uh, Brittany, to see people at Life Care just take the time to get the tablecloths just right is just so meaningful to me. You know, they have the time to make sure the tablecloths are just right, you know? Um, and then thank you, Pam at Star Valley. We have, um, we have people very serious about their volunteer jobs. Like don't mess with my job. <laughs> it, it shows you how important it can become to people. I've heard a quote over the years, guys, someone in a nursing home actually told a psychologist, I want them to give me a job that I get in trouble if I don't do it. That's the kind of responsibility adults often want. So good. All right, another great one. This will be fun. Mm, wouldn't you appreciate it if people asked you and it got on your care plan, what you need for a good night's sleep? Uh, I, I didn't know if I could turn this into a poll or not because there's so many things, but what comes to mind for you? What do you need for a good night's sleep? <laughs> and if you can unmute, just do it for fun. Otherwise, in the chat box, someone tell me. I need to be listening to an audio book to go oh, to sleep. Wow. See, that's pretty specific, right? Thank you, Pam. I need a room that's cold and yep. a warm blankie. Yep. My, my daughter, Brittany, has the heater on. She's in the basement, a space heater, but it's hot in there. That wouldn't work for you, right? It's so interesting. We're kind of like opposites, you know? Raise your hand if you're a fan person right? My husband would. I would raise your hand if you're not a fan person, you know? <laughs> it tends to be one or the other. Cold room, not cold room. Dark, not so dark. Need a nightlight, right? Um, how many of you love lots of pillows? I only need one pillow. You know, are the blankets just right? And it goes on and on and on. And to me, this is a fun one to get after what people need and helping them find it for a good night's sleep. Uh, also, making sure on the care plan you have preferences that people have told you for end of life. Uh, very important, as we all know. Uh, also, care plan meetings accommodate uh, the resident and family. Hopefully, this is a very old thing, but in case it's not, nowadays we're so blessed to not only have phone and, and speaker phones, <laughs> even though they're like old now, the whole Zoom thing, I'm, I'm sure that's a non issue. Uh, I hope so the timing of care conferences, et cetera. Uh, if you didn't know this, uh, not only is it a culture change practice, but it's actually at this regulation that the CNA, um, CNAs are supposed to be part of the care planning process more than they ever were before. Uh, that came out in 2016. We were pretty proud of that as the culture change movement because we've been advocating for that. Um, I know through COVID, it's been hard. I've worked with teams that really wanted to do it. Uh, maybe now's the time coming out of it to get back to that very good practice. Um, someone who can speak uh, to the daily needs and preferences of people that work with them. Um, then 
I hope this is happening. I'd, I'd love feedback from all of you, even the ombudsman on the line. Uh, a comprehensive care plan is given to residents and families in an understandable format. Um, very good practice, obviously. And then uh, also all team members who care for an individual um, provide input into their care plan and they receive information regarding their care plan, their preferences, and even their life story. So making sure all the right people are involved at both, both ways. Uh, then we have team members who also care for the individual make use of the care plan goals, the residence goals, and whatever's on the care plan, basically the approaches um, that are identified. Notice I use the word approach. Uh, that is a word we're trying to use to replace, who knows, what's the word, trivia question. We're trying to replace what institutional word with the word approach? Not sure. Intervention. intervention. Yeah, oh. nice job, Pam. Yep, intervention, everybody. Oh, Think like of the that. word intervention in your in your real life. Think of your life at home, outside of the nursing home. If you're talking about an intervention, what are you talking about? <laughs> Whew, kind of a big, bad, ugly thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, like what, Patty, comes to mind? Um, like you're a drug user? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's what I'm getting at. So the word intervention is kind of a harsh word in a way. And I've, I've just realized over the years and learned from others that I don't know that we really mean it. You know, we don't mean it in such a harsh way. What do we mean? And I think maybe what we mean, what do you think guys, is approach. Because don't you take a different approach with this resident compared to that resident? What are the approaches? If I work with this person, guide me. What are the approaches that work well with Susie compared to Sally, right? And so it becomes a softer uh, word approach. I think it actually is more articulate to what we mean. And also you can add the word individualized to really get some power out of your, you took a breath, you're gonna say a word, individualized approaches says a lot more than interventions. What do you think? So that all was being well known, uh, the section being well known. Notice a lot of it has to do with um, uh, uh, getting individualized things about the person on the care plan. So before I move on, any thoughts or ideas or questions about that section? Be well known. Do, do you guys give a copy of the care plan to residents and families or, or not really, or a summary, or is it just in the beginning? I think that's required of the baseline care plan and the regs. Can anyone speak to that? I'd be curious to know. Every time we have a care conference, we uh, offer a copy of the care plan to the families. Very good. Has anyone taken you up on it, Pam? Yes, we oh, have okay. some that want a copy. Very and we've good. had residents who have asked for a copy. Good. Oh, that's so good. Transparency, right? There you go. <laughs> no secrets. Yeah, kind of like us having uh, every, every reason if we want to be able to look at our medical record, we should be able to. Very good, thank you. Anybody else have anything? Otherwise, we will move into home environment and accommodation of needs and preferences. Um, let's see, oh, interesting. Brittany uh, shares, Brittany, you wanna just tell us? Are you not able to unmute? There you go. Um, so at Life Care, um, their care plans are posted in their closets. Cool. Um, for a few different reasons, overturn with staff, different things like that. That way their care plan is always present um, in their room. Uh, and if the family wants to look at it, it's there as well. Um, I'm sure they would give a copy if they, if they asked. Um, but that way it's always visible for family, the resident, and the staff. Wonderful. That is actually kind of an old practice, guys. I mean, just because I'm getting older <laughs> and I've been in the movement for like 30 years now that was in the beginning of the movement is to actually get that care plan more handy for people and putting it in the closet was where that comes from. So Brittany, it's cool to hear that that's a current practice. I didn't even know that at Life Care Casper. Um, yeah, thank you. So moving into home environment and accommodation of needs and preferences. Ooh, there's a lot here and it's so good. 
The first one is that people actually live in a small group living area. Now, forgive me. Uh, that may sound wordy, but we didn't. We had to figure out how to say all this. So by a small group living area, what do we mean? A neighborhood, a household, a small house or greenhouse, but it includes a full kitchen, full kitchen, dining area and living room. So uh, you, you guys in Wyoming have um, several greenhouse communities now. Uh, I do believe St. John's is a household model. I'm not sure if they have full kitchens. I don't know if anyone would know, but uh, that's the idea here. Um, that people really live in more like a house instead of a hall of an institution. Here's a picture of a household model nursing home in Kansas, Metal Art Hills. Notice they even have a front door because you and I have a front door. Uh, they have a doorbell and they have a mailbox. And this, this organization made a big deal out of calling it the sanctity of the household. I would not just walk into your house and you would not walk into mine. You would knock or you would use the bell. And uh, I've also learned something special from the people who live at this home. They, they ended up telling people, we don't want you just to walk through like a tour. We want you to visit like you would in us in our home. You have to spend time with us. <laughs> Talk about the sanctity of the home, right? And then the next artifact is that people actually live in private rooms. So thankfully in these typical built households and small houses, uh, private rooms tend to be the thing. Most of us are gonna want that, right? And people are really making a big deal about that now that this is what people want. We all want this. Um, I've also seen homes in Colorado turn the, the shared room into a nice large private room and they've, and they've made it work. I think that's impressive. We've also seen in the research that a private room tends to stay uh, full longer people tend to want it um something to, i don't know if we could see more of it maybe and then uh residents live either in those private rooms or privacy enhanced shared rooms so living space is separated by a partial wall um as you can see in this photo this home is in missouri many years ago it just means a partial wall in 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 these typical rooms and i got a video clip to share with you <laughs> pam I, I didn't know I was going to do this, but here comes Star Valley. You'll have to tell, is it Russ? I think that he was famous and, and you know, <laughs> he was shown today. So this comes out of the, the Wyoming culture change clip about Star Valley. It's on Facebook if you want to see the whole thing. These are a semi-private room, two residents. There's a resident on either side here and they share the, the restroom in the middle. And, uh, some of the residents was very disturbing when in the middle of the night or whatever, they had to help the resident on the other side and the lights were on and, and uh, they could obviously hear and, and the light and it, it really disturbed their sleep and different things. And so that's one thing we did was extended the wall up to the ceiling. It still allowed our, our fire sprinklers and things to work like they're supposed to. Um, that way it gave them a little bit more privacy from the light and the, and the noise both and uh, helped divide these semi-private rooms and make them a little bit more private. <laughs> Unique story there at Star Valley. I think it's probably you, Pam, that noticed that, um, why is there this gap? And it was causing problems, like you said, with the lighting. And so many homes have done it and it's a wonderful thing. I, I think if I lived in a nursing home, I'd really appreciate it. How about you? Okay, moving on. Won't surprise you, the home has no nursing station uh, and teams, team members work in areas that are accessible to residents and families. So the leaders of the culture change movement that figured this out realized that it, you know, it's not normal. It's not in your house and mine that there's this big nursing station in the middle. And rather than um, you know, just put in a television, the point here, this picture kind of points it out is to basically just have tables for anyone um, to sit down, whether you work there, visit there, or live there. Uh, so if you do that, please know that it's meant to be replaced ideally with living space for the people who live there. Um, and then notice there's still workspace as well. And the workspace for staff has just been sort of not the focal point, more normal. Some homes have just worked to put in a normal desk 
and just more normal living room furniture around the desk. Um, and then I also really appreciated learning from this home in particular that just even to tuck away the medical records does wonders to create home, to not have to even see them. So that was many years ago. This is a pioneer, Sister Pauline, who helped start the Pioneer Network, uh, which formed in 1997. They were already doing all that. Um, another practice is to eliminate, or how about better yet, never use med carts. Uh, Brittany, I'm guessing in the greenhouse model, that's common. Don't, they don't even start with them. Wouldn't that be amazing, everybody? But, but it's okay if you're working at getting rid of them. <laughs> uh, Brittany, in your setting with the greenhouses, uh, are they using locked meds in people's rooms? Uh, yes, we have, um, we have cabinets in each room. Uh, for all of their meds, the narcotics have to be locked up in a room. So we do have a med room, um, but it's sure. actually labeled as a den. Ooh. Um, nice. And so, so that room is locked and that's where their narcotic, narcotics are kept. Um, but their individual meds are in their rooms in a cabinet. Thank you. No med yep. carts in greenhouses. Woohoo! Yep, I didn't think so. Isn't that cool? So here's a home that um, really transformed from the old model to a household model. Uh, and the household model just means that these houses are connected. They have a town center, they call it, with kind of an auditorium, uh, snack shop, you know, places that everybody might use. Uh, so they're similar to greenhouses, but different. Uh, and, and it was my joy to spend a week in one and study it. And uh, this photo shows you that in the private room, they, they, they probably, I, what I'm trying to say is the home designed this cabinetry to fit this room. And you also see here locked medications. Um, and so that's a beautiful way to be able to get your meds on a more personal level, often in your room, unless someone wants them at the dining room table, you know, of course, uh, per person. But uh, people have always touted the benefits of a nur the nurse getting to have a little uh, more personal time with someone and it not being so public and um, getting rid of the med carts. All right, next we have that all residents, whether they're standing or seated, can actually see themselves in a mirror. <laughs> so this can look however you want it to look. Uh, it's up to the home. But I happen to have this photo that I've always been impressed with. First of all, those mirrors are tilt mirrors. So they are helping the person in the wheelchair to be able to see themselves. And then I love showing you how the maintenance team created two sinks instead of one. They isn't that great? If you think of a master bath, we get each our own sink. <laughs> so here's two strangers living together. Shouldn't they have their own sink? Uh, speaking of sinks, it's actually a practice in the tool um, that the sinks can be reached by the person. And so I show this picture because this sink is actually adjustable. Apparently some are. And so if the person's shorter, you can bring all that down. Or if they're taller, you can bring it up, piping to go with it. Isn't that cool? Uh, I hope this is in every home already. Uh, each resident's toiletries are within reach. I hope all your team members know not to move other people's things. They tend to put it where they rem you know, like to have it and think that's where it is when they go to get it. <laughs> um, we also have created the practice that closets are more accessible and the rods are movable. So, you know, obviously the biggest win here is if someone's usually in a wheelchair, which so many people are, can they reach their clothing? And being able to bring that rod down uh, makes that possible. I, I'm get, I think I've heard over the years, like even having two closet rods, maybe some clothes up here that are, you don't wear as much or out of season and some below um, can work. Plus this is in the regulation, um, tag 584 environment, people are supposed to be able to reach their closets clothes in their closet. Uh, now, <laughs> residents are permitted, oh, it used to say that I think, residents are welcome, friendlier word, to decorate their walls according to their preferences. So what do we mean? 
obviously with, um, we put removable hooks and strips. We didn't put the word nail, <laughs> but we could have, you know, it's kind of been a thing over all the years. I hope your organization doesn't act like you can only have four nail holes in your walls when in fact it doesn't cost a lot of money to fill in nail holes or paint. And it's a, at the very least something we can give to people who live in a nursing home, right? And then I love these photos, the same home in Missouri. Uh, wow, they did so much in the early 2000s. So I know it's older wallpaper strip on the top there, but they would show residents um, some choices. Would you like, you know, these choices of curtains and bedspread, I think, and wallpaper. Um, and, and they told us that usually someone moved in, didn't really want it to be changed. <laughs> Isn't that great? So they offered choice, but often didn't even have to do it. Uh, and then see here, they also really supported people to bring their stuff. Our stuff is important to us. I love these photos. They even committed to helping residents bring their own quilt, bring their own bed by also offering to make them flame retardant if they weren't already. So there are dips and there are sprays that you can use to do that. And then you keep track. The nursing home said, we'll keep track. We'll make sure the quilt gets that, you know, when it needs it again, every six months or whatever it is. I don't know. Um, you don't see that very often, but that's a big commitment to a person having their own things. And I really appreciate it. Now, these photos are the same room, believe it or not. <laughs> and sometimes people get a little nervous. I don't think there's any reason to be nervous, you know. Even though there's a lot of stuff, it wasn't where you walked. And so I, I think it proves a point, everyone, that most homes, most rooms don't look like this, but they could. I mean, look around, like there's her clock and her fan and her TV and her plants. Oh my gosh, and her fish tank, she got that in there and her refrigerator, <clears throat> her TV tray, isn't that fun? And notice too, on the TV tray is what? A nebulizer. And again, so much time has passed with our movement one of the early messages in our movement was if you look into most nursing home rooms, you mostly see what's wrong with the person. Isn't that interesting? So imagine none of that personal stuff, but there's the nebulizer, right? And then, and then the flip side, isn't that cool? This, these pictures prove the point that when it's all about the person, their medical needs aren't seen quite as much. Isn't that beautiful? I just love it. It's almost like, where's Waldo, right? Where's the medical stuff? Oh, I love it. Okay, next we have, sorry, all the buttons don't always work together. Next, we have an extra lighting source if requested. That's pretty easy, like a lamp. Uh, the next one, lighting throughout resident areas is sufficient. I hate to tell y'all, but research shows that most lighting in most nursing homes is not bright enough. You could do your own little research, talk to people, ask people, look around, uh, look at those regs about lighting. It doesn't take much to kind of go after that. I, I wish we all did more of it because um, a big study in the early 2000s showed that most nurse, four, out of 40 nursing homes, they were all um, typically like average on a light meter was one from one to 10. <laughs> which I can't even believe I'm telling you, but probably let's just talk in generalities. Uh, it's too dark. And then you think of older eyeballs or how about nurses giving treatments, you know, CNAs, et cetera. We need good lighting, um, just really good lighting, not bad lighting, you know, not fluorescent either. And, and then at nighttime, people do need some night lights sometimes to see or not fall or to see to give care, but not flip on the only fluorescent over the bed's, you know, ceiling light either. Uh, similarly, uh, it's a practice that you would minimize glare from unshielded windows on shiny floors. If you have shiny floors, we all know that that glare can be hard on some people. Uh, then one of our favorites, institutional over the door call lights. So the typical institutional over the door call lights are actually replaced with alternatives like a porch light. So in this photo, which I've loved showing all these years, um, that's, you see the porch light and that's actually the call light. And so when a resident 
were to turn on their call light, it's actually a porch light that lights up and it's not above the door. And uh, Brittany, I think of you, Brittany's uh, idea was to do this. They didn't quite get the permission to move the light, but do you wanna tell them, Brittany, what you did do? Mm -hmm. So we ordered um, four different types of porch light that sit flush up against the wall. And we um, accommodated that where we, we, we made them work. Uh, because they're not really designed to fit that panel behind them. And so all of their call lights are now a porch light over their door. They don't come down to the side because our corporation wouldn't let us move them. Um, but when we put their mailboxes up, we also gave them porch light. Woo! So way to go. Now they have an address instead of a room number. Mm, way to go, Brittany. You can be so proud. So Brittany, I learned from you. Like, I don't know that I would have thought so well at the very least. Make that a pretty light up there. <laughs> And you did, you pulled it off. So I love it. And then, you know, it's, it was better than what you had before. And uh, technically with the tool, it'd be partially implemented. Maybe someday someone says, yeah, let's move them down. If y'all move them down and it becomes a thing, maybe there's pressure to do it this way because it's more like home and less mm -hmm. like an institution, right? Yep. Yep, I agree. Okay. Or better yet, a silent call system. Ooh, that'd be even better. All right, you also saw a doorbell there and um, a mailbox. Uh, the, this team taught us years ago that it doesn't cost a lot of money to go get a doorbell. It just takes a little battery and you've given back that, that sanctity of the household. Notice they also got door colors changed to be beautiful colors. Residents were also able to choose, you know, kind of a, whatever you see the, <laughs> I don't know, I'm trying not to call it a mural, but that idea of painting, some people wanted it to look more like an awning over their door. They did all sorts of things. And then the next practice is that the home actually has a silent call light system or they've turned off the audible feature. So you know how a typical call light is both visual and audible. If you didn't know this, CMS in their regs all these years, 30 plus years, it has said, or it has said, you must have a call system that is audible or visual. Did you know that? Isn't that crazy? And I'm working with the team right now. I think it's hilarious that considering turning off the audible and just going with the visual, and then you get rid of all that noise. Woo, go Polaris. All right, now we have, <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Larissa used to work at Life Care too. Brittany, they're saying, go Life Care. And Lori says, Larissa, should we make reservations now? You might want to, guys. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, team members communicate with each other without using overhead paging. Woohoo! Can I hear an amen? You do not have to use overhead paging. Many homes don't do it. In Colorado, we got rid of it. You can too. There's so many different ways to communicate now, for heaven's sake, right? If, if we're not doing it now, <laughs> there's no excuse. You know, people have done it even before texting and cell phones. And then here comes more mailboxes that is considered a culture change practice. Brittany worked with the people who live there. So did Pam at Star Valley to, um, give the choice to the people who live there, what kind of mailbox they wanted. A current trend is, help me Brittany, country mesh, maybe Pam? Yeah, they're a, they're like a chicken wire. They're very uh -huh. country chic. Yep, yep, that's right. Maybe you've all seen some, we've shown their pictures too, uh, because residents can see it. So fun to see what they decide. All right, moving on. Your home would support the right of residents to have a refrigerator in their room. Brittany, between you and me, raise your hand if you were going to want a refrigerator in your room. <laughs> two out of two. <laughs> yep. I love it. And residents and families have easy access to microwaves. By the way, we really wanted to say a microwave in the room, but you can all imagine the chaos that created and even thinking about it and it, you know, couldn't be in everyone's anyway. So the next best thing, you have easy access to it. The same with a coffee maker. Personally, I'm going to want my own coffee pot in my room. Anybody else? 
And I have a feeling you're going to hear more of that as baby boomers come. And you know what? At least don't say no. <laughs> you know, just say, well, let's see if we can work it out. And then if you have easy access, that will help people a lot. Um, in dining rooms, meals are eaten um, without the trays, not on trays. Please tell me you don't see trays out there anymore, everyone. <laughs> Food is removed from any tray that might be used for transport. Um, another practice, we serve on normal plateware or china or glassware, normal silverware, and disposable is only used, you know, when disposable should be used. <laughs> we won't bring up COVID. How's that? How about that? <laughs> oh boy, there's a big memory, huh? Uh, notice this photo. Oh, I just love these photos where this team uh, got colorful plates and real glasses instead of that plastic. I, I know people that, and I'm one of them actually, I can't drink coffee now in a plastic mug. I can't, I just can't. And it doesn't taste good and people deserve better. And I've heard people say, well, sometimes the glass mugs are too heavy. Sure. They might be for some people. I've seen other places go after like that Corel China that's a little bit lighter. There's lots of options out there. Each dining room table has condiments. Yes. And they shouldn't all be in only little packets, you know, condiments like you and I would have at home. Wi Fi is available at no additional charge. Passwords are displayed, easy access and assistance is provided if needed. Sufficient outlets. Is that catching up with any of you <laughs> these days? I remember 10 years ago, people talking about, wow, we're going to need more outlets and teams just like smart administrators just going, yep, start in one room and keep moving because we got to have them. Isn't that great? Good, good work. All right. This has been on the tool since 06 that uh, there's an accessible outdoor space for resident use at times of their choice. They don't have to ask permission um, and assistance is provided, you know, uh, I don't know if any, any of you have been around as long as I have, but it's a very institutional practice that we tell people you can't go outside because we don't have time to go with you. Very institutional practice. Uh, that's what we're trying to get after here. I've seen uh, homes that have put in the uh, handicap door, press the button so people can get in and out on their own. By the way, the home I'm thinking of had a dog. Guess who else let himself out? to go pee and come back in. Isn't that so cool? Nobody needed to help him. All right, the home has its own outdoor walking or wheeling path that is not a city sidewalk, kind of like this photo here. Again, space in my home, in my yard that I can go have access to and get outside. So important. Okay, next one. Except for emergencies, overhead paging system has been turned off. And in, this also includes like some places speak over the phones, like it goes through the phone, like a speaker uh, phone, but nope, turning it off. And then residents and or families have easy access to a washer and dryer for their own use. Um, and staff might help if, if needed. So this is very common in the household model. For instance, um, Brittany, is there a washer and dryer in the greenhouse booth in, in each greenhouse? So there are two washers and two dryers in each greenhouse and a laundry room with um, tables to fold as well as a mop sink in case they would like to rinse their laundry or pre-soak a stain. Sure, okay. And, and anyone can use that laundry yes. room, I would presume. Yep, good, it's their home. Okay, of course you have your own in each house. So what I love sharing with everyone is even if you are representing an older nursing home, there tends to be like a nook and cranny somewhere that people find to, to add a household washer and dryer. And I've just always appreciated that. I could see myself wanting to wash my clothes. I do it on cold, a lot of it on cold um, if I was able. And then, and then if the resident's not able, think of the family. You know, historically, we've had a family schlepping laundry home, schlepping it back. And then I think about the money we spend. Even you and I were taxpayers. All the money spent on nursing home care. Should families have to schlep anything? <laughs> you know, really? And then if you had this, now families might be more apt to hang out and tend to the laundry and play cards or go outside and 
or bake cookies. Woo! You know, come on, this is living life. All right, for homes without full bathrooms in the resident rooms, residents are escorted to bathing areas, either fully dressed in a robe and slippers, I should say fully dressed or in a robe and slippers per their preference. Hopefully that's not an issue, but it has been in our past. And then in the bathing area, each resident has good privacy. Um, culture change practice, no locked living areas. Life Care of Casper happens to be an example, uh, right, Brittany and Larissa, of a home that used to have a locked memory care, I think, and then chose not to. And I, coming from Colorado, I saw a lot of life care buildings do that at one point. Yep. Uh, perhaps it's changed, but tell us more what you know about that, Brittany. So, um, yeah, Larissa says you are correct. Uh, life Care did put out um a nationwide policy they no longer have locked memory care units um and that that was for lots of reasons uh but the interesting thing is that when we got rid of that locked unit um and we we brought them out they didn't even stay in those rooms they were integrated into the regular um space with everyone else and then that hallway was backfilled uh with people and when we've all been in a memory care where it's a hallway and they just go like this all day long and they get to that doorway and they rattle the door and they pound on the, on the, you know, the pads and all of those things, they stop. When they can go and they can go into the sunroom or they can go into the library, yes, they still wander and they're still looking for whatever it is, but they stop pacing and they're not as nervous or anxious anymore. It's wonderful. Yep, it is. And look at this, everyone. Um, <laughs> I've never done that during, during a webinar. I actually used the marker feature, uh, the hidden restraints. We are calling the locked <clears throat> neighborhoods the hidden restraint for what the reasons Pam just said. Of course, you would be upset. Of course, I would be upset to be locked up. And when you stop locking people up, they're not upset. <laughs> it's just normal, common sense. Uh, and not everyone talks like that, but if the more we all talk about it, it's really a hidden restraint. And it's it's not great to do that to people and there's ways to not do it. Okay, and now I have to stop doing the marker thing. <laughs> hey, oh. hey, Carmen. Yes, yes, Larissa. Really quickly, the one yeah. thing too uh, that I think is very important to focus was the decrease of behaviors that we saw. Uh, mm -hmm. Residents mm -hmm. or community members who we were often engaging in, you know, time, trying to decrease behavioral issues or resident to resident altercations and so on. Once we were able to eliminate the locked unit, we saw a huge improvement because um, then they were no longer confined. And so I highly encourage you. And, and ultimately, uh, one of the concerns that we had from family members and from staff was around where we were going, if we were going to have to uh, discharge some of the community members that we had at that point and we really did not we saw them thriving so highly encourage if you if there's still nursing homes that are not set up properly for memory care to consider um, opening that up thank you Larissa love it love it, you love it. appreciate it all right uh, hopefully you guys are doing this if not new practice to take to your team Based on resident preference, residents who use wheelchairs are actually seated in regular chairs in the dining area. What a wonderful thing to sit on a regular chair and get out of the wheelchair. Uh, we do know of people who like maybe just don't want to feel like can't, but I'll tell you what, this is great for <laughs> improving skin, great for increased mobility uh, and dignity. And then also prior to moving in, notice it doesn't say admit, Real people don't admit to houses, right? Uh, prior to moving in, and then also when changes occur, families notified um, of amenities and opportunities available. <laughs> Notice it says like serving on committees. Pam, I think of your um, your welcoming committee. Uh, Life Care of Casper has so many volunteer jobs, you guys. They have a list, not only a list, they have a class. You can go to the class to learn all the volunteer opportunities. Isn't that great? 
Uh, what if you had a massage therapist on certain days or a computer center, you know, letting people know about these things. 89, in a home with corridors, seating areas affixed to the floor as permitted by life safety code are available. So life safety code 2012 allows for uh, chairs in the hallway so people can walk and rest and walk again as long as you follow a few simple things like they are bracketed to the wall, they do not move and you never go past six, six you always have at least six feet. Um, number 90, to provide safe travel between bed and bathrooms, night lights are used in resident rooms. Uh, 91, we don't use any audible alar alarms anymore. Uh, 92, mm, the home does not use bibs or clothing protectors or shirt protectors, whatever they might be called, linen or paper are used instead. You know, this is such a big topic, everybody. And I'll just tell you from what I've learned from the movement, bibs have been listed as an undignified practice since 1987. Isn't that crazy? But now they're normal and people want them. And I'm not saying they shouldn't want them. Uh, okay, I'm not. Uh, what, what we got to all grapple with is, are they normal? Even though people want them, is it normal? Is it normal for adults to wear bibs? And we're kind of saying, yeah, it is when they live in a nursing home. And all I know is that homes that have gotten rid of them, here's what they've done. They've talked about it with the people who live there, I guess. And they've talked about what's normal and what's adult and what you might be willing to try. <laughs> and I don't know what to do with this. Um, of course, it's their choice. But here's the, the bigger question is, before it was a choice, how did bibs even get there? That's what we're always up against when we're in a movement to make things normal. And I just need you to know, some homes have done it. They've gotten rid of all of them. They do use linen napkins. You tend to need an oversized one. You tend to need like two per person. You got to get a cotton poly blend. Don't just get polyester. It'll dribble off. Um, but some, some homes don't have them. I've even heard administrators say, yeah, we don't invest in undignified things like that anymore. So forgive me. I'm just a voice uh, for the movement. And it's, it's on the tool. And then noise at night is minimized to enhance resident sleep. Things like squeaky wheels on carts, staff talking loudly, other noises, ice machines come up a lot. <laughs> They're pretty noisy. Okay, so we got through that section and just familiarizing you with the tool. This is just a mock-up uh, example of what one home might look like. The tool guides you to get your tally totals and then your percentages. And um, I already mentioned ways to use it. I'd love to know, are any of you using it that are not in the culture change project uh, with me? Really, really curious. Uh, let me know if you know of anyone doing that because that, that's the way to get it used more and more and more. This is what the guidance looks like. I mentioned explaining some of the terminology. Uh, there's a whole part of the website dedicated to artifacts. There's an artifact for assisted living if it interests you, if you have any touch with assisted living. We have, a, the Piner Network has a ton of free resources. They also have some for sale. They have uh, videos. We made some tutorial videos uh, about this tool. Um, and back to Wyoming, we have a big goal, two big audacious goals. Number one, get this, our big goal, gotta help us, is every person working in a Wyoming nursing home learns about culture change and we could use your help. The, the recording link will be available here soon after I send it out, please forward it. Please ask people to watch it. Maybe give them some homework, I don't know. Uh, we'd love to see this grow. And then the next goal is even bigger yet and this will take longer. And that is that everybody, anyone who lives in a Wyoming nursing home does not get woken up per the institutional schedule. So natural awakening, you know, we call ourselves healthcare, and yet we wake people up. We deny health because it's healthy ah, to sleep. I highly recommend you watch um, the videos on Star Valley and Life Care at Casper and Westward Heights and Morning Star and Mission at Castle Rock. They all went after not waking people up, and they have amazing outcomes. I invite you to join us next month, June 30th. Um, same time, we'll finish out the tool with sections four and five, family and community, leadership and team member engagement. And before I forget, I don't think I have a slide. I don't know how I did that. Uh, I hope someone's coming from your home August 11th 
is our in-person one day culture change training free in Lander nine to four. Um, a registration link will be sent out soon. Um, and it's gonna actually come from the Wyoming Center on Aging because they're also offering a special infection prevention workshop the afternoon before that has um, an escape room element. So hope, hoping that entices you all to come. Last month, we did a poll. We're gonna do another poll in a minute. Look at this, everyone. Look, I would rather live in a what? A facility or a home? 100% home. Need I say more? That's one of our words. We're trying to get rid of facility. We invite you to talk about home and community or just the name of your place. Um, let's do a poll real quick. I know we're at the end, but here's my poll for today. Would, would you rather be called a patient, a resident, or a person, an individual? <laughs> well, we'll see how this turns out. What do you think, guys? Which, which way is it going to go? <laughs> well, polls are so much fun. <sighs> Thank you, thank you. I'm almost done. I'm gonna end the poll, share results. Look at that, once again, we have 100%. Would rather be referred to as a person or an individual. Need I say more? <laughs> uh, not telling you what to say, but notice the power in words. Um, I have a friend who says, oh, resident. He was a person way before he was a resident of a nursing home. I just love that. I've never heard anyone say it better. And then some of you have worked as a community to think about language. You just heard Larissa refer to community member. That's what they say at Life Care of Casper. That was their chosen title instead of resident or patient. Um, and we've also seen some teams go to neighbor. Uh, Pam, I'm curious, do you guys use neighbor? I'm thinking maybe you did. I know South Lincoln did, um, but watch this everyone. Instead of being a new admin, you would be the new neighbor. Isn't that lovely? Or the new community member. Mm. Again, need I say more? Does anyone have anything they'd like to add or ask? So or I will big... say, because you, you're talking about community member and Larissa said it, uh, we pushed really hard to change the word resident and we shop for elder at Life Care First. Uh, and our community members at the time brought up in their council meeting that they didn't want to be an elder. They didn't want to be called elder. They preferred resident or community member. And so that's what we ended up staying with. So they still use the term resident because it's what they requested. Yep. Beautiful. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Beautiful. So beautiful. Oh, there's the five videos I've been talking about on Facebook. Um, please go watch. And we're trying to make you guys famous. Wyoming, great work and so many beautiful outcomes. You know, this is so, so meaningful nationally that national leaders have something to go look at as well as using the Artifact 2.0. You're the first state to use it. And we need that. We need someone to be the first, you know, and we're trying to get more to follow. Um, and this, this grant is winding down. So we also need your ideas, your input to keep, keep it going. Um, your coalition will live on if you wanna join it. That might be one way. By the way, Amy Holt team is on. Thank you guys. They're part of year three, as is Polaris and Bighorn and Legacy Living in Gillette and Platte County. So you'll be hearing a lot of special things about them in the future. I want to toss this out to everyone. What would you think if there was a voluntary star, let's say, you know how there's the five star. Um, the artifacts idea in the beginning was to get it into the five star, to have a piece of quality of life in there. Um, I don't know if you like that or not, but it's our government. <laughs> it's our five star. I say, let's get it to happen. Come on. I need someone's help. And what if a state like, I don't know, Wyoming um, did their own thing? We've talked about this. What if there was a voluntary star and you didn't have to do it, but you could maybe fill it out annually. And we had a database of Wyoming homes. I'd love to know what you think of that. Um, so I'm going to end out, uh, be aware of artifacts of the institution, start to call them out, start to learn these artifacts of culture change instead, promote them, learn all you can, become a culture change leader, advocate, and maybe even call yourself that. You know, there is no title out there like that, but the more we say, hey, I've been studying it, 
I'm, I'm, let me be the culture change leader. Let me lead a committee or whatever, do something um, and get support for it because I contend changing institutional culture is still the answer. People want to live there. People want to work there. Did you know Westward Heights has no job openings right now? Everybody tends to love it. It's better all around. Regulatory compliance, are you kidding? You go way above and beyond. And so please join us to make, make it all about life. Care should be a given, don't you think? And help, help us help people lead really good lives. Uh, any, anything else, anybody? Otherwise, I thank you for joining me tonight. Today, happy Friday. Thank you, Carmen. You bet. Thank that you. That was fabulous. Thank you, Lori. Thanks for joining us from Alaska. Woohoo! Woohoo! Woo thank you. Thank, thank you, Carmen. Carmen. Have a good Bye, weekend. Everybody. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, Irina. Bye, Thanks, Carmen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.